Hey guys, you are just in time because today we are taking a closer look at one of the defining albums of the 1990s, a record that put Smashing Pumpkins on the charts and it almost didn't happen. I'm talking of course of Siamese Dream released 20 years ago on July 27th. This is record one, side one, track three, today. After the release of their debut album, Gish, the Pumpkins were under tremendous pressure to be the next Nirvana. We, we never ever got compared to Nirvana never. before Nevermind came out, now we're getting compared to Nirvana. And it didn't help that Siamese dream producer Butch Vig just happened to produce Nirvana's Nevermind, so he was eager to prove that he wasn't just a flash in the pan. Actually, I never really took any um... Do you have no Classes, schooling or no anything? School. Just I just kind of learned by the seat of my pants. Faced with this pressure, frontman Billy Corgan had a nervous breakdown and fell into a depression with suicidal thoughts. He says that at the bottom he was faced with a choice. There's nothing else to live for, so I might as well make the music I really want to make. Out of this, a flurry of songs were written, including this one, which was the first song written for the album. But the problems didn't end there. During recording, drummer Jimmy Chamberlain would disappear for days on end due to his heroin addiction. And guitarist James Eha and bassist Darcy Retsky broke up. To make matters worse, they were both deeply offended by Billy's move to play 98.8% of the guitar and bass lines on the album. A move that almost caused Darcy to quit the band. In Corgan's defense, the album was running over budget and behind schedule. When faced with the reality that he could play a guitar part in two takes that would take James 20, the choice was clear. While both James and Darcy created parts that were used on the record, the fact was they couldn't play at the level that producer Butch required. What do you think keeps a band together? <laughs> In the end, the album was a complete success, both critically and financially, selling over 4 million copies in the US alone. Flipping over to side B, we have track two, Disarm. Holy cow, guys. This is one of those songs that you remember the first time you hear it. I remember I, I, was, I was in the fifth grade, I was 11, and my friend Matt and I were playing at the beach and there was a car radio that was playing this song and, and it just stuck in my mind. It was just something about it. It's it, so, so epic. And I didn't even know who the band was. Disarm is probably one of the most important songs I ever wrote for myself. It's hard sometimes when a song is so close to you and so personal to understand the way other people see it because your version is so dominant in your mind. And this is one of the few songs that no matter how many years go by, no matter how many times I play it, it still hits me the same way. I remember people even back then talking about how great this album was, even in the shadow of the massive success of their follow-up, Melancholy and Infinite Sadness. And it continues to be a fan favorite today, as it's the one Billy autographs the most. We're going back to side A, we have track one, Chair Brock. In 2011, Virgin Records re-released Siamese Dream and Gish on remastered special editions on both CD and vinyl. Now, if you're a die-hard fan, Amoeba Records in Hollywood has an original pressing for sale. Here we have a good friend of the show, Amoeba Store employee Joe, showing it off. It features a gatefold cover with peach-colored vinyl. Thanks, Joe. This reissue features the same cover art as the original, but in a new foil-lined cover. It also has inner sleeves for each record with the lyrics printed on one side and a floral pattern on the back. And because this boasts 180 gram vinyl, both records come in poly-lined sleeves and... You know, it just occurred to me that some of you may not know what 180 gram vinyl is, so I'll let Professor Watson spread your mind open. 180 grams of vinyl refers to the actual weight of the glob of vinyl, called a biscuit, that's pressed into a record. Your standard records will vary between 120 and 150 grams of vinyl. Audiophiles and collectors alike prefer heavier pressings of their favorite albums, as it offers the master stamper to cut deeper grooves into the vinyl. In addition, the heavier vinyl is less prone to warping and surface noise, allowing for higher dynamic mastering. As a general rule, the heavier the vinyl, the higher the quality, and production costs. Thank you for learning. Holy crap, that was a mouthful. Thank you, Professor. We're moving on to record two. We have track two on side one, Mayonnaise. Though it was never released as a single, this track is widely considered the definitive pumpkin song, and I couldn't agree more. I just can't get enough of it, guys. 
Honestly, if all you know of the Pumpkins is their hits, do yourself a favor and pick up this album. It is really a cohesive whole and it's a testament to the craftsmanship of pre-digital production. One more thing before we go, I have some awesome finds. So just this past February, a new social media slash collector site popped up called VinylFi.com. It's basically a place to keep and manage your vinyl collection online. But how it's different is that you create a profile, make friends, and even link your YouTube account. You can even create wish lists so your friends know what to get you for your birthday. The other cool thing is that if you already have a Discogs account, you can import that data to jumpstart your profile. My favorite part is that when you hover your mouse over your profile pic, the record starts to spin. It's the little things. Well, we are all out of time, but I want to thank you guys again for watching. And be sure to drop us a comment and let us know what your favorite pumpkin song is. Until next time, I am your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you for learning. Do a little bullwinkle, that's it.